Prepare yourself for the terror. The prison of madness where few enter and none return. Welcome to Unsung Horrors. With Lance. And Erica. Leave all your sanity behind. It can't help you now. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Unsung Horrors, the podcast where we review underseen horror movies, specifically those with fewer than 1,000 views on Letterboxd. I am your co-host, Erica, joined by co-host Lance. Hey, everybody. So this episode, it is my pick, and we will be discussing The Skeleton of Mrs. Morales from 1960. As of this recording, this movie has 757 views on Letterboxd and an overall rating of a 4.0 out of 5. If you haven't seen this movie and you're worried about spoilers, we are going to be getting into some of those. Uh, there is a Spanish version on YouTube if you are, uh, if you are fluent in that language. Um, and there is also a Blu-ray by VCI, which is how both Lance and I watched it, because we are not fluent in Spanish. <laughs> well, I'm not. I, I mean, are you Lance? I'm not. No, okay. I wish I was. Yeah. I mean, I can get by in like Tijuana, but that's about it. Yeah, hey, I'm from the Rio Grande Valley, so I know I know some Spanish. Yeah. So Not enough for to watch a movie. Mostly just <laughs> horrible phrases and bad words. Yeah, Pr- yeah pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to obtain drugs, find a bathroom, and order a beer, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> so. That's all you need. Yeah. The Skeleton of Mrs. Morales. It's mostly a black comedy, so a lot of people might watch this and think, like, this doesn't really feel like a horror movie. If I were to classify the genres of it, horror would probably be the last one on there, but it still definitely has some horror elements. But this is actually considered by critics as one of the top 100 Mexican films of all time. So just as a quick overview of what the movie uh, of what the movie is about, it centers around Pablo Morales, who is a sort of cheerful, happy go lucky taxidermist. And but he lives with his very manipulative, bitter, religious, religious. She's extremely religious wife, uh, Gloria. Now, Pablo They've been married for 15 years, so we're going to talk about this probably later. I don't know if they've ever had sex because Pablo wants to have children, but Gloria doesn't. She's constantly denigrating him by telling him that he smells of the dead animals that he's working all day, and she refuses to have sex with him. She purposely seeks to ruin like even the smallest joys that he gets in life, so from like a well-cooked meal to enjoying just a couple of drinks with friends. She even falsely accuses Pablo of abuse and on top of thinking he, he's a drunk. She even goes so far as to bruise herself to make false accusations that make her story much more believable to others. So that's all established about her. In the meantime, Pablo has been saving money to buy a camera because he loves to take pictures. But Gloria steals the money that Pablo is saving and gives it to the church. Fortunately, Pablo does get the money back and then he subsequently buys the camera, but Gloria then breaks it, which is what finally sets him off. So Pablo takes his revenge by poisoning her. He then dissects Gloria's body. He places her skeleton in the front of, uh, in the front window of his taxidermy shop. And then the local priest and Gloria's family start to become suspicious of that. So he's put on trial, but he manages to he manages to evade prosecution because the skeleton that he constructed was only partly composed of his wife's body. And so the medical I'm going to say this in quotation mark experts uh, (laughs) conclude during the trial that it is not the skeleton of Mrs. Morales, but Pablo can only get away with this for so long. So getting into some of the film specifics, this was directed by Rogelio Gonzalez. He also directed the ship of monsters, which Lance and I both saw at fantastic fest last year. Love it. Love that movie. Yeah. It was part of a Mexican horror film retrospective it's a not necessarily a horror film because that one's more like sci-fi silly. It, how is it sold to us? Like a Mexican plan nine 
from outer space or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I think that's exactly what it was. But yeah, it's it's like a mu- it's like a musical sci-fi weird romance kind of. Yeah. It's wonderful. <laughs> so much fun. Uh if you're interested in hearing more about that movie, I actually did a guest spot on Late Night Psychorama at the end of September, where we covered that movie and one other. So you can listen to that episode and hear me gush about that movie. So Gonzalez was also a regular collaborator with director Luis Buñuel. And in fact, most of the people who worked on this film, on The Skeleton of Mrs. Morales, both in front of the camera and behind it, were regular collaborators with Buñuel. And so I, I don't want this to turn into an episode about Buñuel because, <laughs> I mean, that couldn't even be one episode anyway. But it's worth pointing out that some of the tone at, but and most definitely the social commentary of this movie are very akin to many of Buñuel's films. However, this film doesn't share the surrealistic aspect that's common to a lot of Buñuel films. Um, this plays it much more direct. And not to say that Buñuel's films don't have a sense of humor, because they do, but Gonzalez's Mrs. Morales leans much more into that aspect. A number of reviews that I read about this film even cite this as something like a Tales from the Crypt episode. Which, yeah, I could see that. Yeah, I, I definitely see that. And just, you know, a last thing about Buñuel, well, it's not going to be a last thing about Buñuel, but if you've never watched any of Buñuel's films and are interested, um, there's a few streaming for free on Amazon Prime right now, including uh, That Obscure Object of Desire, The Young and the Damned, and The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie. One of my favorites, besides The Exterminating, a- the Exterminating Angel, is Belle du Jour. Um, both of those have Criterion releases, so... That's the end of my plug for Buñuel. <laughs> so, um, so the actors in this film, Pablo Morales, Dr. Pablo Morales, the taxidermist, is played by Arturo de Cordova. He made a few American films, uh, including For Whom the Bell Tolls in 1943, and he was also in Luis Buñuel's L. Uh, Ampara Rivelis plays Mrs. Gloria Morales, and for the most part, she was just in a lot of telenovela work. And then there's quite a few people in here, so I'm just going to do one more. Uh, Antonio Bravo, Father Familiar, is probably the next highest billed person. He was also in some Buñuel films, including The Exterminating Angel. Uh, The score was composed by Raul La Vista, who also did Buñuel films. (laughs) And the screenwriter, Luis Alcoriza, he also... (laughs) Did the screenplay for Buñuel's Exterminating Angel. So this is like the last episode it, where it's like yeah. everyone was like on Nightmare Beach. <laughs> yeah, it's Primal Rage and Nightmare Beach. It's yeah. Just- <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler, Exterminating Angel is not going to be my recommendation for the double feature. <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting about Luis Alcoriza, so I, I did, in addition to the skeleton of Mrs. Morales. I I've already seen a few Buñuel films uh, previously. I watched a couple more the other day, and then I also watched a movie that Luis Alcoriza, the screenwriter for this, wrote and directed. It was an '80s horror movie called Terror in Black Lace, which was described as a killer with a hair fetish killing a woman and getting caught dragging the body out by a lonely housewife. And then she has to escape from him. And it sounded great on paper. And unfortunately that's only about 20 minutes of the movie. And the rest of it is like a, uh, or like a telenovela drama between the husband and wife. So I was a little disappointed in that one. And then lastly, the cinematography was done by Victor Herrera, who also did the cinematography the cinematography for The Black Pit of Dr. M, 1959, which was also at Fantastic Fest last year as part of their Mexican retrospective pro- programming. Did you see that one too, Lance? I, no, I didn't. Okay. Did Hard you? recommend. Yeah, that one's great. It's really, it's uh, it's got this great eerie gothic uh, feel to it. it. It feels like a film Vincent Price, you could just plant him in there and he would fit right into it. It's just great. Uh, it's funny to say that because I actually could see kind of uh, Pablo Morales. I could see a little Vincent Price, you know, kind of tapping him on the shoulder, like, let mm-hmm. me give this a go. You know? <laughs> 
<laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I can see that for sure. Okay, so that's it for the crew. We're going to get into more of the film right after this promo from our network. You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal, providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. Okay, so getting into the into more of the film, the first time I watched this, just right off the bat, I, I gave it three and a half stars. But then when I rewatched it, I actually liked it a lot more because with the first watch, you're reading subtitles, so you want to make sure you're not missing anything that anybody is is saying. Because I have a heart, like I, I just have to, I can't watch the action and read at the same time. I know there's people who can, but, and I can read fairly quickly and the action is still happening, but because this movie moves, it's moves really kind of like the dialogue is really quippy and, and fast. And so trying to keep up with it was like, okay, I'm just getting a sense of what's going on. The second time I watched it, obviously I didn't need to pay very much attention at all to the subtitles because I already knew what they were saying. And so being able to see like the, the mannerisms and a lot more of the humor in it on the second watch was, was yeah. kind of my experience with it. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. Cause I'm the same. I usually read at the first watch. Um, and this movie has so much beautiful cinematography. Like you were saying, I hated kind of reading the text, but it's you know obviously completely necessary, mm -hmm. but I did watch it a second time and the reactions that the actors when they deliver their lines there's so much acting going on in their eyes and in their reactions with the lines that it's yeah you you, you miss it if you're actually reading the subtitles yeah uh, especially with gloria mrs yeah. morales she yeah. was she had her eyes all over the place and was picking out what she was going to hate on before she started speaking and while she was speaking so i loved watching her yeah, absolutely. Like I picked up so much more about her. Like I hated her so much more. Yeah. The right second. off the bat, you know, she's unbearable. You you can tell she's making shit up. Yeah. I mean, but like when you can start to notice those, those shifty eyes that much more without having to pay attention to the subtitles, it's, it's so much better. And you're just like, Oh, you fucking bitch. I just hate you so much. And <laughs> like the movie, the movie spends a lot of time establishing that about her. Like I was expecting th the way that the, the movie is uh, like the short summary of it, you know, a, a taxidermist kills his, you know, decides he needs to kill his wife. You think that's going to happen closer to the beginning of the movie, but they spend a good, you know, half of the movie establishing just how shitty she is so that we're right. all on his side. And I'm like, yeah, fucking kill her. Cause she sucks. Yeah. <laughs> well, she's, a, I mean, yeah, right off the bat, he, uh, Pablo enjoys everything. He's smiling, everything in the opening scene when she's talking to the, uh, the priest mm -hmm. and she's talking about how he's a horrible husband and she may, he makes him do things and makes fun of her disability and doesn't, you know, hates kids. But right off the bat, when you meet Pablo, He's loving the kids in the neighborhood. He's playing with the dogs. He's always smiling. So right away, you're like, okay, this guy is fucking, I'm, I'm on his side, no matter what. Yeah. And you don't want to root murder. You know, you don't want to root it on, but, uh, now speak but for yourself. This, <laughs> well, in this case I did. I mean, I mean, in a lot of cases I do, let's be honest, but, uh, <laughs> But Mrs. Morales is, was very confusing to me. I mean, you know she's unbearable. You know she's lying and manipulative. She has the town fold about what they feel with Pablo. But when she's alone with Pablo, she plays. she's still playing the victim, but she's kind of like, you know, when will I die? You know, she says things, when will I die so you can be happy and alone? Yeah. And it, it it's very interesting. Like, she's planning Basically, she's almost inviting him to like, hey, I'm a fucking unbearable person. Go for it. You know, yeah. do what you got to do to be happy. 
but it was some of the scenes just really, really left me wondering, like, I can't really figure her out. And I, I like, like you said, they spend so much time setting her character up and she is terrible the whole time, but she does flip flop in weird situations. Like, okay, I can see why Pablo is spending 15 years with her yeah. in some situations. Yeah. But 15 years without sex with that scene. Yeah. And I don't know, I can't tell if, cause her, her leg wasn't, so she has a deformed leg. Mm hmm. Right, uh, yeah. which just looks like a enlarged kneecap, kind of like a growth or something. But he, you know, he points out that it's not hereditary, and she always brings up her disability, you know, throughout throughout the movie before she's killed. But I don't know if it was an affliction that came on during their 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 marriage. Oh yeah, yeah. They didn't establish if that was yeah before they got married or after. We the only thing we find out is that. It's not something that she was born with, even though she insists that that's why she doesn't want to have children because she thinks she'll pass it along to them. But it was a result of her getting with tuberculosis, I think they said. Yeah. I okay. Think, I think so. I don't know if I remember that. <laughs> well, it was, it was a result of some, like she had a disease and it was a result um, or an affliction and it was a result of that. It wasn't anything hereditary. And even like the, quote unquote, scientists at the trial say that ab right. about her. So let's just quickly kind of go through the list of all the shitty things that Gloria does because <laughs> she sucks. So she is a bona fide <laughs> bitch. Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, you know, we already we mentioned already that she is extremely, extremely pious. This movie makes her that way, I'm sure, because it's got a very heavy handed anti-Catholic message in it, which if you miss, then I don't know what you're doing, but, <laughs> um, so we already talked about how she's never slept with her with, with Pablo because she says she doesn't want kids. She thinks she's going to pass her deformity along. So he walks in on her naked and, uh, when she's in the bath, um, in the shower or the bath and mm -hmm. she covers herself, she won't even let her husband look at her. And he tries like, Hey, you know, you're a beautiful woman. And, She's like, no. And then finally she kind of is like, well, maybe, okay. But then she tells him, no, you need to go wash your hands in alcohol because you're dirty from the animals that you touch all day. Yeah. And that's definitely a triggering point for Pablo because she says it at least, at least three times throughout the movie. Yeah. So and many times. That, that when, when he's making the moves on her and it looks like for a minute she's going to give in when she says that, that's when he clinches up. And yeah. Oh, it's a great scene. shot too. And it's like a, like it's in the, the fist is in the forefront and yeah. you just see his like, like fingers, cr you know, crunch in and just make a fist and you're just like, Oh, yeah. right there with you, Pablo. <laughs> yeah. I do it now. That's what I was like. It's, <laughs> it's okay. I want to see the skeleton of this woman. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she, yeah. She even thinks that like, so yeah, she won't let Pablo look at her naked. Uh, she thinks that any kind of nudity is obscene because he's got like a book, uh, a photography book from Africa with mm. naked women in it. And she's like, Oh, how, you know, how dare they kind of thing. It's, she uses uh what else? She uses eye drops for tears before when she knows she's having visitors come over. She, she gives herself bruises. Yeah. You, to, to, to prove to people or not, you know, to, to not prove, but to fool people that uh, Pablo beats her. Yeah, Which. she she broke his camera and then she starts fucking screaming like no Pablo no stop hitting me. Yes. Like oh. super loud so all the neighbors can hear. And he <laughs> leaves and when he comes back, she has bruised herself up to make it look like he beat the shit out of her. Yeah, and, and she tries to poison Pablo's bird, his Yeah. Hawk. And that is like, oh my goodness, infuriating yeah. to watch. I, that, and, and, and it's the reason, I think the reason she said is because they're, the bird and Pablo are one and the same because they, they both eat meat and stink of raw meat. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> was actually, life. yeah, that was actually where I was like the most tense in the movie. Cause I was like, is the, are they going to kill the bird? It's a beautiful hawk whose wing is broken. And Pablo, because he is such a wonderful human... <laughs> brought the hawk into his taxidermy place not to kill it and stuff it, but to heal the bird and then let it go and 
fucking bitch Gloria comes in and is like, I'm going to poison this bird because you guys eat meat and you're terrible. And that's another <laughs> thing that she does. She doesn't let him enjoy yeah. a fucking meal. Yeah, that's what I was wondering, too. If this is like some sort of jab against vegetarians, like maybe like they, they're they making vegetarians look crazy as fuck and horrible people and just unhappy and, and lost in their own pity because they can't enjoy a good steak. Maybe. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't eat meat. I'm, I'm a vegetarian. So I, I noticed that because there's a lot of funny scenes that she says, like it smells the same as your job, dismembering the animals. Yeah. It looks like the animals you stuff. And that whole scene of him eating the steak is just hilarious. Like it's laugh out loud funny where she starts gagging mm-hmm. and then he starts gagging and he's like, oh my God, would you stop it? <laughs> yeah. He's, yeah, she's making those vomiting sounds and like, she's like, <laughs> like that and he's like i por favor gloria you know and just like come the fuck on let me eat my fucking meal because he even said he's like i'm gonna go downstairs and eat and she's like oh wait i'll join you and he's like no it's fine you don't have to and she's like no no so it's like she purposefully was like no i want to come down there sit at the table so i can fuck up your meal yeah, that, I guess that's where I was confused is she would pull shit like that. But you're right. It's a good point. She she goes along with him so she can ruin his enjoyment of everything that he's going to go do. Yeah, everything. Ugh. Gloria. But she is beautiful. That's why that's why Pablo, I guess, fell for her. Yeah, she is. <laughs> Only on the outside, though. Yeah. I mean, that's why he had to clean out the inside. Yeah. One exchange that I did really like was... So after she steals the money that he's been saving to buy uh, his camera, she gave it to Father Familiar as money for part of the, they're trying to restore some Catholic altar or something like that. So Pablo gets back and he gets, he gets the money back from the father. He's like, I know you have it. Give me my money back. And she protests and says, no, I promise to pay for the marble. And he asks her, why do you want to do more than others? Isn't that the sin of vanity? Yeah. My and father. She, and like, <laughs> <laughs> so good. Yeah. That was my favorite. I was like, yeah, take that. Cause even the father was like, Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pablo's really smart in how he handled everything. I mean, except it, you know, his the one, one flaw. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what's, what kills me too is like, he, you you okay? So you really know that she enjoys torturing him when he says we can get a divorce. He offers. He's like, I can leave, or you can leave. Like we can get a divorce. The church allows it, right? And she turns around. And she's like, No, you, you think I'm a slut and blah blah blah. Do you want to leave me because I'm crippled? Yeah, and shit like that. Yeah, I just oh my god, fuck you, Gloria. Well, yeah, and her sisters there, and her sisters you know, fooled like everybody in the town who mm-hmm. think that Pablo is just, just this horrible person, except for his buddies at the bar. Yeah. But her sister's there in that scene where he's like, Hey, the church allows it. Divorce is not a problem. I'll, you know, I'll leave. Your sister will be glad to take you. And she starts yelling, no, you want to do that? Cause I'm a cripple. See sister. And her, and then uh, her sister calls her a martyr. Like, Oh, you're a martyr. You know, you're, <laughs> I'm like, Oh my goodness. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when Pablo goes, I think he goes smoking with his, her, uh, his brother-in-law, um, mm-hmm. Gloria's sister's husband. And Pablo seems like a kind of on the side or not Pablo, uh, the brother-in-law seems like he's on Pablo's side for a little bit, but then he's like, you know, if you leave her, that'd make me mad or that'd make me sad and very mad. And then he flashes like a fucking, like a pistol. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he's like the law or if he's just walking around strapped, but I, I liked him. I liked him sticking up for his sister-in-law. Yeah. <laughs> but he also seemed like he wanted to be on Pablo's side, but right. couldn't. So Yeah. There was those scenes were they were funny together. Like he's really struggling it. He's all that would make me sad and very mad. You know, like he's <laughs> fighting with this, like, I have to do this, sorry. <laughs> yeah. And I guess kind of like the last thing that she always does is accuses him to others of being a drunk. Where he's like, I had a beer or I had a glass of wine or whatever with my dinner. Like I, you never, ever see him drunk, but yet she's constantly like, he's an abusive alcoholic. And it's just like, no, he's just like, he's out having a drink with his friends. Like, 
Right. Uh, and every, every scene he's drinking, he, he proves it without like her or any of her friends being around. He only does have one drink. That's yeah. She's making shit up. Uh, she's got to go. So eventually, you know, when he breaks, uh, when she breaks the camera, he's like, that's it. You're, you're done. So he, he poisons her by, she makes this drink, which I still don't understand how people can drink raw eggs and milk mixture things or whatever, but also like it had like alcohol in it or something like that. Yeah. That was a really gross drink. Like, I don't, I don't know if there was, were they putting like medicine in it for her or was this like sugar? I couldn't tell what was being. Yeah. It was like milk, uh, milk, eggs, spoonfuls of sugar, and then like a dash of some kind of out liqueur or alcohol or something like that. Mm -hmm. So he gets uh, some kind of poison from his taxidermy uh, lab. lab. Is it a lab? I don't know. Studio. Studio. It's taxidermy studio. There you go. <laughs> and he puts poison in like fucking everything. Yeah. He's like, I'm not taking any chances. Like he puts it everything. on the bread in the milk. He injects it into eggs. Yes. He puts it in the liqueur. Like every fucking thing that she could possibly eat poisoned <laughs> and so she takes her she gets her drink made she drinks it she dies and then the next thing we know we see he's packing up her her bags to make it look like she left and he has her in his like big tub to melt off all of the skin and flesh and everything. So he can just have like the skeleton and he's constructing it with all the, like the little boys from the neighborhood are running around in his shop. And he's just like, Oh, Hey, yeah, so nice to them while he's like putting together the skeleton of his dead wife. <laughs> <laughs> so he puts the, he puts the skeleton together. He puts it on display in front in like the window display and the Catholic priest walks by and sees it with, I don't remember if it was a couple of the parishioners uh, or parishioners and, or uh, Gloria's sister. But at one point he had come by and said, where is, where's Gloria? And he said, Oh, she left to go visit her aunt and Guadalajara. Guadalajara. Yeah. And the sister comes back and is like, we don't have an aunt in Guadalajara. Where is she? And he's like, I don't know. She left. And then the, when the priest sees the skeleton, he sees like a, deformity in one of the legs in the skeleton and like there that's her and so he gets brought in pablo gets brought in and gets put on trial for murder which is a whole other just extended comedy scene in, a, yeah. in and of itself there's so many like three stooges moments in there yeah but eventually what we find out is that Pablo basically he has to listen to all of these people testify against him. And we we as the audience know none of this stuff is true. Like there's people who are like, he's a drunk, he's this, he's that, he's all these terrible things. We know that. Pablo doesn't really do a good job of defending himself because the only thing he says is that, <laughs> like, well, the house is in my name. I didn't have a reason to kill her. And I'm yeah. like <laughs> I'm like, that's more of a reason. I mean, like, I mean, I, I, yeah, he's like, you know, I I uh, I owned and paid mortgage on the house under my own name. What? How is that a motive? I'm like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so really, the only thing that actually does get him off is when they bring in the scientific quote unquote experts to look at the skeleton, and they're pointing out all these things on the skeleton that make zero sense if you know <laughs> anything about science, but they make sense to this court. But ultimately. <laughs> They are like, uh, it has something to do with the hips. And they say, well, this skeleton has had, maybe has had babies or something like that. But right. this is not the skeleton of Mrs. Morales. And so Pablo is um, found <laughs> innocent. innocent. Everybody cheers. Like, even the people that were calling him a drunk and a, you know, wife beater are happy because she's not dead. Yeah. And his, you know, his, his buddies are like, yeah, we knew that he's innocent. And everybody kind of stands up and walks over and congratulates him. And he, the whole time during this trial, he's in a cage, he's in like <laughs> a jail cell, like yeah. in the middle of the courthouse, which is fun to watch. Yeah. 
And so they're all convinced that they're like, oh, okay, I guess he was telling the truth. And she left to, I think his last story was like, he convinced the preacher, like, didn't Gloria tell you that she wanted to be a nun? And he convinces everyone that she ran off to a nunnery. Right. And my next, I guess my next sort of favorite part when it comes to Catholic bashing is when Pablo goes to the church. So he goes to the Catholic priest, uh, father familiar to, cause he wants to confess and he confesses to the murder to the preacher, a priest. And, and the priest is just like, what? But Pablo's <laughs> like, A, you can't do anything because A, this is confession and B, I've already been found innocent. So double jeopardy. So Lottie fucking da. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, confession is secret and sacred. You can't tell anyone. Yeah. But then he says, ask for forgiveness for my soul. I can't because I'm not regretful. And I was like, yeah. Yeah. I loved it because I was just like, it's so the trial itself. I honestly think like he meant to get himself caught for double jeopardy just so that he could confess and put the priest in the conflicting situation where he would have to betray his faith by breaking the rules of confession to tell others Pablo's truth. Right. Ah, uh, so good. Yeah. But if, it, if there's any priest, I mean, that character, uh, that actor played that character so well because he was just violently angry and hateful towards Pablo like from the first moment he walks in the door yeah, because of everything that Gloria is telling him. And because Gloria is giving him a thousand pesos, you know, for his church, obviously he has, he's playing favoritism and he, he believes everything she's saying because she's funding his, his addiction, but Mm -hmm. it's, he plays like hatred so well. Like I'm yeah. If, if what happened at the end of Pablo to Pablo didn't happen, I would, I would actually think he probably would have told the police (laughs) because he was like an asshole priest. Yeah. Yeah. He, he would, he would betray his faith and like all, even more so proving Pablo's point. Like you guys are hypocrites, you right. know, before we get to the end, I did want to talk about like some of the other like side characters, the Catholic troop, I guess there's the historian guy and the woman who always has to pee. <laughs> yeah. Who like, had bladder surgery and she can't control her, her bladder. Yeah. It's, so it's just these cute little like comedic touches like that when it's like a serious topic, you know, the woman is like, oh, like she gets nervous and she like runs off to go. She's like, I have to pee. And then the the man in that group of people starts almost every sentence that he speaks with. Well, as a historian, yeah. <laughs> blah, 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 as a historian, blah, blah, blah. And so when he's testifying during the trial, Pablo looks at him and says, well, as a historian, do you think that blah, blah, blah? <laughs> it's just great. Um, yeah. And there's also the, 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 I mean, the camera cells woman, Ms. Castro seems to have a strange part in all this too. Mm. Like she's, she's a widow. He, he goes over. So when he, but he goes and looks at this camera, obviously he's been eyeing a camera for a long time. They kind of establish that the characters know each other and he's uh, like, Oh, She's like, oh, if you really like this camera, I, I get a discount. I can help you out. You know, 1,200 pesos. He's like, well, I don't have my money. And that's when, you know, he goes home to get the money and finds out that Gloria has given it to the, you know, the congregation there. Mm-hmm. But he, he does get the money and he goes to Ms., Mrs. Cas, Ms. Castro's place or, you know, her house. And she has these two kids playing at home and he's having a good time with them. And that whole scene, you know, and then later he goes back and talks to Gloria about how he wasted his life or he, you know, why did I do this? I should have left you a long time ago. We could have had kids running in our hip apartment instead of me paying off this horrible house. And yeah, uh, so it's almost like he's, I don't know if he had some sort of plan with Ms. Castro. I don't know if it was a plan as much as it was like. Yeah. Just it was just a reminder of what yeah. he did, and, yeah. And it, but she's kind of, I mean, I, her son was named Rogelio, and I was like, oh, it's the director. Oh. <laughs> it's cute. It's cute. But, and then his buddies were also funny too, little great background characters like the professor and the drunk maestro. Always mm-hmm. wanted to have fun with Pablo, who always has just one drink. Yeah, always. Yeah, all the like 
little side characters are everyone's just they're delightful yeah um, and it's it's worth pointing out too when he's the first scene when he's at the bar with him the whole time that him and his buddies and the bartender are talking about there's no such thing as a perfect crime. Right. That's, yeah, that's, yeah. That's kind of like where this, his whole crime is, you know, he poisons everything. And then when she finally dies, he burns all, everything that he poisoned and he burns all her stuff. And, you know, basically he's going for the perfect crime. And then there's that one scene where he's like, I feel like I'm forgetting something. Mm-hmm. And that's when we get to the end. Yeah. And then, so we find out that the one thing that he did forget as great of a job as he did with everything else, planning for him to get caught so that he could get off and not be tried again, gets rid of her, the luggage that he packed, all the food that he poisoned, except he missed one thing. And that was the, the liqueur that he also poisoned. And so at the very end, when some people come over, including all the people who had accused him of the murder. They come over to celebrate his freedom with him. One of them grabs that bottle, pours five or six drinks, I think, and hands them out, including one to Pablo. And they all drink it. And as soon as everyone takes a sip, he takes a sip of it. He knows what the liqueur is and that he forgot it. And then like five people die. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Including the lady that, had the bladder problem because that ends on a great scene too. It shows her feet. Mm-hmm. And she crosses her legs and then the, <laughs> the liqueur, which, you know, it looks like peas starting to drop down, but it's hers dropping her gra- glass dying. Yeah. Which I thought was really fucking funny. It was, it was adorable. And then yeah, five coffins are being carried at the end before the credits. Yeah. Uh, it's so good. It is. It's good. I just, um, it wasn't what I, expected it was going to be based on the description because it is much more the horror element takes a backseat to so many other aspects of the film, but um, I'd still definitely call it a horror film. Might maybe more like on along the Hitchcock lines, but yeah, uh, I got, I got kind of like, have you ever seen the trouble with Harry? mm -mm. It's, it's very comical for, uh, for Hitchcock. And I, the whole premise is pretty much they come across a dead body and they all think they might have been involved in this and killing this body. So they're trying to hide it, all these people in town. But it was very, it was a lot of that. I got, for some reason, I was reminded of that. Okay. Neat. I'll add that to my list. I'm still catching up on so much Hitchcock. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's talk about, what. It, well, what did you end up um, giving this on Letterboxd? I gave it three and a half stars. That's solid film. I mean, the whole, like we already talked about some of the, we talked about the cinematographer, uh, Mm -hmm. but there's so much fantastic camera work. The first time I watched it, that's what really stood out to me. And, you know, I kind of looked away from the subtitles because of it, but there's so many like long takes and like tracking shots from like the opening scene where Mrs. Morales is talking to the, to the father in her room. There's this weird zigzagging across the room up to both of them talking and then there's like an immediate cut to a shot behind her headboard which i was like oh this is gonna be fucking this is gonna be fun to watch yeah and then from like the like well the final scene uh, there's this tracking shot of i think it's the lady that has that peas but she grabs that bottle of uh that has the poison in it and it basically follows her right behind that bottle she's holding the bottle the whole camera kind of tracks that she grabs the bottle pours the cups and then it follows the cups going to each person. So, you know, who's going to get it. Mm -hmm. And then it just like, there's so much great camera shots in this. It was just fun to watch. Like I do want to watch it again. Yeah. It's a gorgeous movie. Three and a half. Okay. Uh, If you were going to put this in a double feature, what would it be? So this, this movie reminded me of a lot of things for some reason, a lot of comedies, Mm -hmm. uh, I was fascinated by the people in the town looking in on uh, Pablo, thinking that, you know, he's doing all these horrible deeds and he's guilty no matter what. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was reminded of like Rear Window, another, you know, another Hitchcock of him watching this man who he thinks killed his wife or his girlfriend. But, you know, he can't really prove it. 
or the burbs, you know, Tom Hanks, the burbs. I think some of those pairings might work. And then I even thought of like uh, Linklater's Bernie every so often. (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) But I wanted to kind of keep it, you know, kind of in the same genre. So I would probably just throw in uh, the ship of monsters. I mean, because they're both funny. They're both, you know, same director, both, both released in 1960, which is really impressive. Yeah. Uh, and also, I just love that movie so much. I'd, I'd pair that with anything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that movie is pure joy. So I don't know how, like, you could go wrong pairing it with anything. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, I think I mentioned at the beginning, first watch, I gave it three and a half. But the rewatch, I appreciated so much more of what was going on uh, with the movie, the cinematography, the, you know, the acting and the, sl- you know, all these little slight mannerisms that you didn't pick up, or at least I didn't pick up the first time I bumped it up. I bumped it up to a four after my second viewing of it. As far as a double feature, I would, yeah, I would agree with you. Like ship of monsters would be great. I think another option could possibly be just going in again in the Hitchcock realm. You could go with psycho. And I'm just thinking in terms of taxidermy, (laughs) It's like right. the main connective tissue there. <laughs> it works. <laughs> <laughs> I think it works. With, it could work with a lot of movies. I mean, you could even get something that's like really fucking harsh and brutal to watch and use this as a palate cleanser. Yeah, I think it could work with a lot of things. So lots of options for a double feature for for you guys um, and recommendations from both of us to watch it. 100%. Okay, so um, before we get to Lance's pick, just a reminder that next week we will have our bonus episode dropping for the Horror Gives Back movie challenge. So we'll be announcing the winners during that episode of the for the giveaway, as well as going through all of our picks for the movies that we watched for the challenge. And I know that some people have said like, well, I've got my own list and I'm sticking with that. And that's totally fine. Like the idea behind this is donating money to charity for the movies that you watch. Now, obviously we like our list, but if you have your own and are watching movies and you still want to donate per movie that you watch, we definitely would encourage you to do that. And you can definitely do that. So whether you're following our list or you have one of your own, you can still be entered into the drawing by making a donation based on how many movies you watched uh, in October. And again, next week bonus episode will be uh, announcing our three winners for that. And then after that, uh, we'll have be back to our regular episodes and it'll be Lance's pick. So what are we doing for that episode? So I'm picking, it's another comedy horror, like what we just watched. This one's called Blood Sucking Pharaohs in Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> the name itself is like everybody needs to watch it, right? It's also known as Picking Up the Pieces. Uh, it was released in 1991. It's about a power tool wielding killer terrorizing Pittsburgh, removing select body parts from the gutted victims. The only clues that two deadbeat detectives can gather from the grisly murders are notes written in hieroglyphics pointing to a strange Egyptian ritual to create a formula that may provide eternal life. The two clumsy detectives team up with a meter maid to track down the serial killer to a lawless part of the city called Egypt Town, where they all fight to stop the cannibalistic psychopath from collecting that last ingredient needed for the formula, and to solve the case of the meter maid's missing father. <laughs> it's directed by Dean Shedder and Alan Smithy. Uh-oh. Um, and <laughs> special effects and makeup by Tom Savini. I remember you telling me that, like, because this, I, I feel like this movie came up when you were on... Customers also watched and maybe it was June exploitation because you had yeah. mentioned like this movie and one other one, just the DVDs just mysteriously showed up at your work and you took them home and you watched this one. Yeah, it was weird. They, there were two DVDs and you know, the, my work, I don't, there's one other person that I know would have like some kind of weird horror movies uh, that I had worked with uh, in the office when we were working in the office. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was, this was blood sucking, uh, Farrah's in Pittsburgh and the other one was Wood Chipper Massacre by uh, <laughs> Ritter, I think. But um, I remember for June exploitation, I did a shot. On, it was a shot on video, and I watched the 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 Wood Chipper Massacre one. And this one, I kind of I kind of sat on. I watched it about a year later, and it's okay. It's good, but it's gonna be. It's on YouTube for those who want to watch it. Uh, but there's a DVD out there, so I got to steal. Um, I'm assuming I 
it was left there for me. But I took the, it's a Lucky 13 cult collectible DVD release. Hey, it is yours. Someone left it (laughs) just for you. (laughs) They were both mine. (laughs) Yeah, but you got rid of Wood Chipper Massacre, right? I did. Yeah. I got rid of that one. I kind of wish I kept it, but uh, I was kind of making room on my shelf. Fair enough. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to to that one. Um, <laughs> uh, if you're not already, please give us a follow on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, all at Unsung Horrors. Uh, you can follow me on Letterboxd at username also watched. You can also follow my other podcast, Customers Also Watched, on Twitter. That is C A W Podcast, uh, or Facebook or Instagram uh, under Customers Also Watched. Lance, where can people find and follow you? You can follow me on Letterboxd, uh, Twitter, and Instagram at L Shibi. That's L S C H I B I. And I have a Lance Shibi. Big Cartel store with a bunch of uh, horror pins and prints and fun stuff for you to pick up. And uh, some people have asked, and I just want to, we're going to plug him whenever we can. Uh, Lance's brother, Cody, who did our logo. That's, you know, I tell people that, but uh, he also has a shop as well. So you can just search Cody Shivey, same last name, spelling, obviously. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, you can find all his his shop stuff too. He's got a lot of stuff in there for Halloween time as well. Yeah. All right. So that is it for this episode. And we will see everyone back next week for our bonus episode. And then after that for blood sucking pharaohs in Pittsburgh. Yes. Night, ev- Night everyone. Bye.